Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, Eunice Biden, uh, who's um, from the uh, Hamilton Institute, named after the famous Hamilton uh, in, in Ireland. And uh, yeah, it sort of um, has a long history of uh, doing, uh, I guess I got to know uh, Barrack and Hunas through some automatic differentiation implementations that happen in the F-sharp language, but of course people do that in uh, OCaml and in, in Python and C++ and all sorts of other things as well. Uh, and then, coincidentally, Hunas has been working on a topic which will be very, uh, potentially very important in lots of machine learning applications, which is just doing a really deep survey on how this technique can be applied across the machine learning spectrum, and I suppose in some ways evangelizing the technique uh, as an as a, you know, important and crucial uh, underlying technique for, for across that domain. So over to you, okay. and uh, welcome along. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah. uh, th thank you for inviting me here, and thank you for coming to my talk. So my name is Ganesh. I'm a postdoc in, at the Hamilton Institute in Maynard University in Ireland. I'm working with Professor Bark Perlmutter uh, at the Hamilton Institute. So today I'm going to talk to you about machine learning and automatic differentiation. And for this work, we are collaborating with uh, Jeffrey Siskin from Purdue University and Alexei Radol from MIT. Uh, so let's get going. Uh, so I'm going to start with an overview of the problem we are addressing here. So let's say you have some data uh, with some given inputs and outputs. Uh, it's just a basic optimization. Uh, so you have a model, uh, which I represent here with the function f. It's parameterized by a weight vector. And you have some kind of uh, loss function modeling how closely your data fits, fits uh, how, how closely your model fits your data. So you, you just do some basic optimization. You, you, and you, you get a fitted model out of that. So well, there are... We, we might be understanding all of this. So, sorry, so, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're assuming we, this is all very familiar. So what's Q uh, and FW? Uh, so like FW is a model. Like a, a model? Yeah. If, I mean, I say model. It's a function that maps from the input space up to the output space. So you have these input oh, so points. From, from the X's to the Y's. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so if can you give an example of it? Is it like X is like is this machine learning kind of? Like it's, X is like a, you can do some uh, maybe like a, you can think about it as a neural network. It has inputs X and it gives you output Y. Like, and these are vectors, like, so... Okay, so it's just a function. It's, it's just a function, function. mapping function. something to another thing. Like, it oh, can I be any, any function, it's just... Okay, it's just a function. Yeah, it's just a function, and it, is, it has this parameter w, and you, you adjust this parameter w to make it uh, represent your... Oh, so it's really your a function of, so what's the, is w itself a vector? Yeah, everything's okay. a vector. So it's a function of two vectors, w and x. Yeah, you can say that, but you, okay. I chose to represent W there as a subscript because... Uh, I that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because it, I, 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 I tend to think about it that way. It's just a parameter adjusting your model. When, and once you adjust that W uh, through... Uh, Q is the loss function. The what function? Loss function. Loss function. Loss. Yes. So okay. it's like an objective function. So you, 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 it's the measure of how... So you, you, let's say you take one of the inputs, X, Okay, let's say you, you have lots of inputs and lots of outputs. You take one of these inputs, okay. so let's say x1, you yeah. give it to your function f, okay. uh, it gives you the output y corresponding to, the, corresponding to that f, x. So what you are trying to do here in, optim in optimization, you are trying to adjust these w's, um, which also go into this function f. Uh, you, you get an optimum set of w values that gives that, that minimizes this thing that I call loss function. So, oh, okay. so it, it measures how closely... It's applied with the input X and the desired output. Yeah, desired And you're output. trying to like, choose like the weights yes. W so as to minimize the total Q. Yes. So why is it Q sub I? I thought Q was fixed in this argument thing. Oh, uh, well, it represents, it represents you have a... The thing I represent with I here is like you, you have a training set. Yeah. So I is the number of the... Uh, input and output in the training set, like okay. the first so entry. Yes, yeah, so, so you, you will have Q1, different Q1, Q2, yes. Q3. So you can talk about them separately. You can have, you can talk about the loss of corresponding to the 
first input and first output pair. You can talk about the second queue, you can talk about, so you can have different queues. If you, if you represent it this way, it gives you the possibility of uh, talking. Different loss functions for each no, pair? No, but not here, not in the slide, but of course you can have that. But <laughs> so it's, it's not really relevant, it's just oh. like, uh, so you, 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 through some kind of procedure, you are trying to optimize this function f by, by adjusting w. Okay, so that's what you do. And so you can do this thing with derivative-free methods. You can have a combinatorial optimization. You can have like evolutionary algorithms. There is also derivative-based methods like gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, like Newton, Newton-inspired methods. So for this type of optimization, uh, you need to supply the derivative of uh, your model function and your loss function so to the optimization procedure. So you have to supply this thing separately. That is how it works. So, for example, you can have methods uh, depending on the gradient of Q. You can have methods uh, using the Jacobian or requiring higher order derivatives like the Hessian matrices or uh, vector products of these, any of these things. So, and you have to supply this thing separately to your optimization thing. Uh, so, <coughs> the the short story here, which is the subject of this talk, uh, <coughs> you. If, the, if the, everything was discrete, this will only work where the x's and the y's and the q's are continuous functions. Is, is that right? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? For It'll only work if the x's and y's and the q's are continuous functions of real valued variables. Yeah, if, if, you, if you use differentiation, it has to be continuous, yes, because you can't define the derivative if it's not continuous. So if, if it's not continuous, you can use uh, non-derivative based optimization. Okay, right. So if you have continuous q's and f's, you, you can use derivative based methods. So. And <coughs> so the thing is, you, you, you have this thing called automatic differentiation, and it can eliminate this uh, derivation step from the optimization procedure and you, it can simplify the workflow of this machine learning uh, workflow. So and it, it, using this you can make the uh, differentiation an integral part of the optimization procedure. So I'm going to talk about that. And uh, another thing is it can, it, it can do this, uh, it can give you exact derivatives and it can support a larger, uh, larger set of functions while doing this. Uh, so <coughs> In today's talk, I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about um, how we can compute derivatives briefly. I'm going to talk about what is automatic differentiation, and uh, we will see how we can use this in machine learning applications. Uh, so let's start with this. So how do we compute uh, derivatives? The, the, the basic thing is you can do manual differentiation, like it's calculus 101. There are uh, rules of differentiation. You just apply that. And it's tedious, but it's uh, very common in machine learning uh, practice. So, for example, this is like a <coughs> this is a recent paper. It's about com computer vision. So, what people do in machine learning is when you have a new model, so you, you per perhaps uh, introduce your model in the first couple of pages, then you spend a lot of pages uh, analytically driving the gradient of this thing. And in the end, you end up using it with some kind of standard optimization procedure. And it's seen as a kind of uh, technical, uh, like technical t thing, like you are showing that you, you do all these derivations, like it's like a technical accomplishment. So of course, there are situations where we need the analytical derivatives, like you can be after analytic solutions to your problem. Uh, you can be after proofs, but most of the time, what we really want is to use this numerical values of the gradient or any derivatives that we are going to eventually use in optimization. So uh, this is something to keep in mind. Can I ask why it takes so many pages? <laughs> I mean, after well, the rules on the previous page are pretty simple. And the well, it does. <laughs> Most of the time it does. I'm sorry? Taking derivatives is not usually that difficult. No, it depends on the complexity of your model. Like, so if it's like... It depends. It, it's not a general question. I'm sorry. So it, it depends on what you are taking the derivative of. So you can. It, this is like an actual paper. If you, okay. <laughs> I don't want to disclose the authors, but you can. It's mechanical. Like t t taking derivatives is completely mechanical. Like it has been. It, that's the idea behind it. Like if if you do it manually, it's mechanical. If you do it with an algebra, small algebra package, it's mechanical. It's always mechanical, but it, it takes time and. So I'm going to uh, talk to you about that as well. 
So you can use the, the, this thing called symbolic differentiation. You can use computer algebra packages like Mathematica, Maple. Uh, they work very well, but <coughs> there is this thing called expression as well. So you get exponentially more complicated derivatives out of uh, original expressions. So let's say in this example, I have the logistic map. Uh, you start by x, and after, f f for example, if you like look at the second iteration, uh, that thing is not very complicated, that, that expression, and the derivative of that is that. So this is not a very big problem. But when you are uh, talking about an expression like that, so this is the derivative out of that that you get. So using symbolic differentiation, uh, the things can get exponential very quickly, depending on your uh, model. So this is this is called the uh, pro problem of expression as well. Um, <coughs> so there's another thing in manual and symbolic differentiation. But you are. In, but in that previous slide, right, you could you could be simplifying those yeah, 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 intermediate yeah. things just down to a single polynomial, and that yeah. would stop your exponential yes, you can. blow up. But it doesn't really stop the exponential blow up. So I I chose this for. Uh, like showing you clearly the problem, but I in the paper I also have I have three columns. I have the original and I have the derivative. I, I have the simplified derivative. You can simplify it. It's for example in Mathematica there is a simplify first procedure, but it still doesn't solve the problem completely. It's still is it because the, the highest exponent is going up exponentially. Is that I, the highest power of x is going up exponentially? Is that the problem? Yeah, I haven't thought about it, but. There is something like that, and this, 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 this is the logistic map is very simple. It's just you don't have any uh, transcendental functions, anything like that. But once you have this type of uh, like sines, cosines, like or maybe I don't know, arc sine or any complicated function, things get completely exponential. Even after simplification, it doesn't really help you after some point. Uh, <coughs> so th uh, there is another problem. It's more important and more relevant. Uh, for machine learning, it's because if you are using symbolic and manual differentiation, you are limited to closed form mathematical functions. You can apply this to only a function defined in a mathematical sense for taking the derivative of something that has to be a mathematical function. So what I mean by that is you can take the derivative of something that looks like this, but you can't take the derivative of something that looks like that on the right, like if you have an algorithm, like doing recursion loops, uh, I don't know, branching conditional conditionals, you can't take a derivative of that. It's impossible. So what we do with AD is we can take derivatives of algorithms. Uh, <coughs> so lastly, the, there is this thing called numerical differentiation. People are very familiar with this. Uh, <coughs> you just use finite differences. You use the limit definition of the derivative. And you, you, you use a very small step size h and you, you get some numerical approximation of the value of the derivative using a different approximation formula. So <coughs> here we have this problem of approximation errors. Uh, you, you, you might think that if you keep decreasing your step size, you are going to get more accurate uh, derivatives out of this. But it's not as simple as that. You have to be very careful when you are selecting the value of your uh, step size. So because if you, let's say you, you start decreasing your uh, step size, uh, you, you increase the accuracy until some point, but after some point, you, uh, so you, you've been decreasing the truncation error, and after some point, if you keep decreasing your step size, uh, this thing called round of error gets dominant, and it again makes, you, makes your approximation less accurate. So this isn't really uh, very helpful in some situations. So <laughs> there are better approximations. You can, for example, use this formula, People know that very well. It's like it's called the central uh, central difference formula. There is this thing called <coughs> uh, Richardson extrapolation. There is this thing called differential quadrature. There are methods, but they increase rapidly in complexity and they never eliminate these approximation errors. So this is the situation with the uh, numerical approximation method. So what is automatic differentiation? <coughs> so. The idea here is that you, you, you have an algorithm. Automatic differentiation gives you an augmented version of that algorithm. And it does this by, uh, so it takes the values in your original algorithm and it, it, 
it, for each value, it keeps a primal part of it and a derivative component of that value for all the, all the computations going on in your algorithm. So using this, you, you compute the derivatives along with the original uh, run of your algorithm. So I'm going to explain how it works. Um, this, is, uh, this is based on the observation that all algorithms are eventually uh, compositions of a finite set of operations. And you can define the derivatives of corresponding to this finite set of elementary operations. You can have an automated procedure uh, computing the derivatives along the way you are running your original algorithm. And you get exact derivatives out of that. It's not an approximation. So I'm going to uh, show you how that works. Uh, <coughs> so the, the, this function started with two arguments and got four. What are the, what are the extra? Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot to mention that. So you have this thing here, okay, it's a function of two, two inputs, so you multiply them, you take the sign. So you give this thing to an automatic differentiation tool, it gives you another algorithm, it transforms that. So this thing you get out of it, uh, you have derivative components corresponding to each original uh, value here in your algorithm. So this thing again computes the same values, it, for example here it uh, computes the multiplication the sign of C but it, it does also uh, compute the derivative of that thing. So I'm going to explain how that works in the next slide. So for example, for a sign, like d is equal to sine of c, so you get d is equal to sine of c, but also d prime, like the derivative of d, is equal to the derivative of c multiplied by the uh, derivative of the sine function. So this is the way you do that. Uh, <coughs> going on inside something like Mathematica when you ask it to take the derivative of some yeah, actually, complicated function? Yeah, in, if you are uh, applying this to mathematical expressions, you, the thing you get out of it, it's exactly the same with the symbolic differentiation like from Mathematica, like the numerical result, the, the way it is computed is exactly the same. But the advantage here is uh, it, you do this while you are running the algorithm. So you are transforming the algorithm, you get something that computes the original values and it also computes the derivatives along the way. So it's not like a, you are not doing symbolic differentiation and getting another function representing the derivative. It, it's just the transformation of your original algorithm. And, and if you do it this way, you can also have algorithmic control flow statements in, in place. So you don't have to get rid of them. You don't have to transform your algorithm into a closed form mathematical expression for taking the derivative. If you do it this way, you can still have all the algorithmic control, and it still works for computing the derivative. So it's like a type of symbolic differentiation that is like doing it in runtime, maybe you can say something like that. Uh, so <coughs> automatic differentiation has two, two modes, main modes. Uh, there is this thing called the forward mode. Uh, it is very straightforward, very simple to implement. There is another thing called the reverse mode. It's a bit more difficult than it's a bit difficult to understand when you see it for the first time. Uh, so let's start with the forward mode. Uh, let's say you have this function there uh, of two inputs. And so the thing between AD is we, we are interested in dependence relations uh, between the inputs to your function and the outputs you get out of it. So uh, for computing that something that looks like that, uh, you, you have to do elementary computations. So you will have some intermediate results, you will have some intermediate values in the computation. And this is how we represent them, like in this computational graph. You can see that this V2 uh, corresponds to this multiplication of, the, of your two inputs. V1 corresponds to the logarithm of your first input, so this one corresponds to maybe the plus addition operation. So. Can I, can I um, just ask you to clarify the yeah. previous one? So my intuition is, Okay, so in, a, in an algorithmic form of some of these functions, you've effectively got a un, potentially unbounded number of terms in the expression. So that you might have a for loop, for example, that might, depending on the input, might involve one term or 100,000 terms, logically, as a mathematical formula. Yeah. Okay, on any particular input, the shape of the formula can kind of change. That's the whole point of the algorithm. And the point of automatic differentiation is it gives you a way of actually computing derivatives at, it, at any particular input, yeah. but you don't actually ever compute the closed form of that. Uh, because that mathematical expression doesn't, it doesn't have a closed form, because it's a potentially unbounded number of terms, you 
you can't compute a closed form version of the algorithmic version of these things. So you, but you, but you can get a function which computes the derivative at any particular point. Yes, that's right. Okay, correct. is that the right way? Intuition. So yes. it, it it allows you to apply differentiation to functions which you can't normally do it to, right? Yes. Functional, yeah, functional descriptions, algorithmic descriptions, which you can't normally differentiate. Is that fair? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes. Including discontinuous functions. Mm -hmm. uh, discontinuous functions, yes, but there is no way preventing AD for doing this thing, but the, the value you will get at the discontinuity, it's, it, w it wouldn't have a meaning, because if you are trying to compute the derivative, it's a discontinuous point, oh, you, you, you should if, if x is zero, if x is less than zero, then one, else minus one. So yeah, so you can you can run that through automatic differentiation. You will get some value maybe, but that value that wouldn't mean anything because at that point your function is not differentiable. And if you are trying to do differentiation at that point, you shouldn't. Okay, the derivative is not defined there. So, so there's sort of a separate side condition that the algorithm is actually continuous, computes a continuous function, and you don't check that condition. You, you don't. Okay. You just trust yeah. the user for not computing yeah. derivatives okay. at that at so points. User, user beware. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. okay I, in my implementation, I raised some exceptions, like for warning them. You are trying to compute the derivative at the point where it's not defined. You can have this type of stuff, yeah. but in many automatic differentiation tools, I think these conditions are never checked for uh, performance reasons. Uh, so, in the forward mode, what you do is you you are uh, propagating derivatives from the independent variables to dependent variables. So this is why it's called forward mode. And basically, you you select the one of the one of your inputs as the variable of differentiation, and you augment each intermediate value in your computational graph with another component, uh, which represents the partial derivative of that intermediate value with respect to the depend, uh, independent variable that you selected, and you you set the derivative component of your independent variable to one. It's by definition because you are taking the derivative with respect to that. And uh, you just run the algorithm forward and you get derivatives in, uh, out of your computation. So you get something like this. So here on the, on the left side, you see the forward evaluation trace of this, of this example here. So you start by some values uh, for your inputs. You run the, all these elementary operations. You get, let's say you get your output here. So what AD does is it gives you this augmented thing here on the right. So it runs at the same time. And so the values here, you see here the derivative components, they correspond to the uh, intermediate values you have in your original algorithm. And let's say you are taking the derivative here of this thing with respect to x1. So you start by setting the derivative component of that to one. And the derivative component of all the other inputs will be zero because they are independent variables. They are not depending on each other. So you just do that and you run this forward. And in the end, uh, at each stage, uh, you get the value that, that will be the derivative of that intermediate uh, value with respect to the variable of differentiation that you selected. And you just run your algorithm forward. And in the end, you get the uh, derivative value and the original value together. This is the, the way it works, basically. Uh, <coughs> so there is this other mode uh, called the reverse mode. Wait, so, so, so that, that means you would need to have several, two results. You need to carry two to, This is the derivative yes. with respect to x1. You need a separate column uh, and a third result for a derivative with respect to x2, would you not? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you, if you want, OK, if you want to, this example is just for computing the derivative of y with respect to x1, yeah. just, just one. So if you have a function of many inputs and one output. If you want to, the gradient of that function, you will have to run this forward mode uh, several times okay. for each of these input variables. So, and this is why we have the reverse mode. So reverse mode is the opposite of this. So I'm going to come to that. Uh, so reverse mode is uh, actually, if I should tell you, if you know the mathematics behind the back propagation algorithm for neural networks, you already know the reverse mode. They are very related uh, because back propagation is just a special case of reverse mode automatic differentiation. Uh, they both traced their origins to the same papers in 1960s and 70s. Uh, but for some reason, these communities, the automatic differentiation community and the machine learning community, they managed to stay 
disconnected. And uh, if you ask somebody, I mean, uh, back propagation is very famous, but if you ask them, do you know anything about automatic differentiation, they will probably not know, know, know about reverse mode automatic differentiation. So uh, in the reverse mode, so okay, let's use the same example, uh, the same function that we used as an example before. Uh, so this time we are uh, propagating derivatives from the dependent variables in the direction of the independent variables. That is from the up to towards the input. So this is the reason it is called the reverse mode. And it is, it is done in two stages. In the first stage, you run your original algorithm forward. You compute all these intermediate values. Then you select one of your outputs as the dependent variable, let's say yj. And you again augment all the in, in intermediate values. But this time, the, the components, the in augmented components, they, they don't correspond to the derivative of that with respect to one of the inputs. It's, uh, this time it corresponds to uh, the derivative of your dependent variable at the output res with respect to that intermediate value that you are considering. And this is called an adjoint. So you have all these adjoint components for all the intermediate values. And you start by setting the adjoint of your dependent output to one, and you run the algorithm backward. So this propagates all the derivatives backward towards the inputs. And you, you end up with something that looks like this. So the, the evaluation trace on the left is exactly the same with the forward mode. So you run this forward, you get your, you, you populate all the uh, original values of your intermediate uh, variables. So you get your output. Once you are done with that, uh, you start by setting the adjoint of, uh, of the dependent variable to one, and you, you start propagating these adjoint values backward. So at each stage, for example, this represents the uh, derivative of your dependent variable with respect to that intermediate variable, like the partial derivative at that point. And if you continue running this backward all the way to the inputs, uh, you end up with the adjoints of your inputs. And uh, for example, in this case, the adjoint of x1 it means the partial derivative of y with respect to x1. The adjoint of x2 is the partial derivative of y with respect to x2. So as you can see, uh, with the reverse mode, you can, if you have a function with one output, in one reverse sweep, you compute all these adjoints, and you compute the partial derivatives of that output with respect to all your inputs in just one application. So, and this is, this is exactly the way uh, backpropagation works uh, for neural networks. Uh, so, uh, forward versus reverse. Uh, if you talk about the extreme cases, like if you have a function of just uh, one input and many outputs, uh, forward mode is the good thing, is, is the best thing for that. Because with the forward mode, if you have just one input, you can run the forward mode and you get the derivatives of all your outputs with respect to that one input. Uh, in the other extreme, if you have a scalar function of many, many variables, and this is very common in machine learning. It's, it's seen everywhere in machine learning. Uh, with reverse mode, you can get all the full gradient of that function with respect to all the inputs in, in just one application of the reverse mode. Uh, in general, if you have a function with n inputs and m outputs so to compute the full Jacobian, which is uh, the derivative of all the outputs with respect to all the inputs, uh, it will take n times the time it takes for you to evaluate the origin of function with the forward mode. And if you use the reverse mode, it takes m times the original time it takes for, for, your, uh, for your origin function. So it means uh, reverse mode is better if you have a function with many inputs not, and not so many outputs. So this is like the uh, big picture of selecting forward versus reverse mode. Uh, <coughs> So AD is already used in lots of fields. Like it's it's very heavily used in computational field dynamics for simulations. It's used in atmospheric sciences, nuclear simulations, uh, engineering design optimization. But for some reason, it's not very well known uh, within the machine learning community. And this is the reason why we are uh, trying to work on this from the machine learning perspective. Uh, <coughs> so how can this impact machine learning? Uh, at this point, I have to uh, talk to you briefly about uh, Diff-Sharp, 
uh, which is, uh, F sharp is an uh, automatic differentiation library we implement in F sharp. And this is the address of the website. We have very detailed documentation. Um, we have a benchmarking tool. Uh, we have a full API of uh, all the uh, derivative operations that you can imagine for uh, scalar functions, vector functions. Uh, we have several implementations of AD for different us usage cases. We have uh, forward and reverse mode working. Uh, we also have implementations of uh, symbolic and numerical differentiation, uh, mostly for measuring the performance of this against automatic differentiation. So I would be very happy if you go there to check it if you, if you are interested in automatic differentiation. Uh, also, because we are trying to do this uh, for machine learning, we, we have uh, example machine learning applications. Um, we show them how you can use AD for these applications. We have gradient descent Newton's method, stochastic gradient descent. We have a clustering using automatic differentiation. We have k-means clustering algorithm. We have Hamiltonian Monte Carlo using automatic differentiation. Neural network examples, and we have inverse kinematics. So these are all on the website. You can just uh, try them uh, in, on your computer. So uh, let's look at uh, gradient descent. <laughs> Uh, so you have a scalar function of uh, an input. It's just basic gradient descent. This is all it takes for you to implement gradient descent in a functional language with AD capabilities, F sharp. So the thing you see there, this grad, grad FX, that, that, that is how you put automatic differentiation in your algorithm. You don't care, uh, worry about anything else. So this thing takes any function, any scalar function of many inputs is a uh, parameter. And you, you just supply your function. You don't need to worry about the derivatives. Uh, you don't need to worry about the form of your function. It can, you can implement it any way you want, and you just trust the uh, AD library to take care of the derivatives for you. Uh, uh, it's better than that, because you can get some complexity guarantees with automatic differentiation, and it's uh, one of the biggest advantages of this. <laughs> Uh, what, what we mean by this is, uh, for example, for if you are computing a gradient with the reverse mode, uh, you, the time it can take for you to find the gradient of this function, it, it can't be more than a small constant multiple of the time uh, for you to, to run your original function. There is a theoretical limit. Uh, uh, it's explained by Grevenk and Walter, so uh, you can check that. So. Uh, I have some benchmark results here with, with my implementation. So uh, here you see the uh, we, we have this thing called the Helmholtz energy function. It's used in the AD literature for benchmarking because uh, this is a, a scalar function of a vector, and you can try it with different uh, dimensions to see how your uh, how your performance scales with the number of inputs. So it's used for that for benchmarking. So here in this table and in this graph, we see the time it takes uh, for you to evaluate the original function with, as a function of the number of inputs. Uh, you have reverse mode and forward mode. So I will just tell you the good thing directly. Uh, so all these values you see in the, in the table, uh, they are uh, uh, given r relative to the time it takes for you to evaluate the original function with just one input. So you see in the last row here, uh, to compute the gradient of the function with reverse mode automatic differentiation, uh, you get a factor of around two. And it, it seems to be independent, as you expect from theory. It's, it seems to be independent from the number of inputs you have. Like, so it's like a uh, linear function of the time it takes you to evaluate the original function. So it's a good property. You can have that uh, complexity guarantee for you. But if you look at something like numerical differentiation, you can see that uh, it's exponential, this dependence. And it's, it's not exact, it's just an approximation, and it, it has very <coughs> poor performance. Uh, forward mode is, of course, better than numerical differentiation, but if you remember, forward mode is not a very uh, good choice for this case because you have a scalar function of many inputs, so uh, reverse mode is the way to go there. So, uh, you, can, you can go to this address. Uh, you can you can run this benchmarks. There is the benchmarking code. There is all the things you need for experimenting with this type of uh, thing with the AD. How, how does the library work? I mean, it's a, we're doing a pretty substantial program transformation, particularly for reverse mode. Yeah, 
Uh, okay. There are several ways. I of walk up to you with a library with a you know higher order function that I'm passing a function in. All you have is a pointer to the function closure. Yeah. So it sounds very clever. How do you do that? Uh, so there are several ways. It's not in this talk. In AD, you you can have uh, overloading, operator overloading. This is the way we do it. It's because it's the simplest way you can do. I started with that. Uh, so you just overload the. You, you have a new numeric type. Uh, it's called the dual numbers for forward, mm -hmm. for forward mode. I I, I haven't okay. mentioned that. So you have a dual number type. You you do you do the operations with this dual number type, and it has overloaded operations, which also computes the derivatives for so each. Yeah, well, well, forward, but what yeah. about backward? For reverse, we also do it with overloading. So you, uh, if you remember, in the reverse mode, you have to first run it forward in the yeah. first stage. So when you are doing this forward sweep with the overloaded operations, it takes uh, it has a stack of operations. It puts everything on top of the stack. So it keeps a stack of all the operations, and once once you uh, call the reverse stage, it pops these things back from the stack, and it, it uh, calculates the address. It just propagates the address backward, and it, it works. So it's the simplest way you can implement. But in in AD, there are many methods, other methods. There is source code transformation tools. Mm -hmm. So for Fortran, for C, uh, this is actually what is used for high performance app uh, applications yeah, like so. Yeah, no, I don't have source transformation yet, but I'm working on that because F# -sharp is very good for uh, for this because you can have um, code quotations like expression trees. It's very good. I'm experimenting with that, and but it's not ready for release yet. So okay. you can also do source code. Like yes, it. yes. Thanks. So, but people in, uh, for example, in nuclear simulations, there there is an AD group in Argonne National Laboratory in the United States. They do nuclear things. They use uh, C, as far as I know, and they just ha have a tool. They give the C source code of their original simulation, and the uh, tool gives them another uh, source code file with the transformed program. So there is also th that is uh, one way you can do that without operator overloading. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, we have an example of st stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so you have a function of uh, n variables and m n inputs and m outputs. So this is how you implement stochastic gradient descent here. Uh, the way I do is, uh, okay, it's not very important, but the way I do it is this uh, function f that you asked in the beginning. And here, this w vector, the parameter parameters of your model function, they correspond to. Uh, ah, okay, it's actually in the next slide. So, so uh, okay, let's, so let's come to that. Uh, so I use stochastic gradient descent for implementing k-means clustering. Okay, uh, this is done in literature. Uh, so the way I do this is I have this uh, model function that I this thing I call model function, and the parameter w here is uh, just the concatenation of the vectors of your uh, means, like the coordinate of your means. You just put them into a big vector. You supply that uh, as a as an input to your uh, uh, loss function evaluation and uh, something like that and so you, you just you can just supply this to stochastic gradient descent algorithm uh, it works beautifully and people ha haven't uh, done this with automatic differentiation but we have it on the website there are papers using stochastic gradient descent for clustering but they don't do it with automatic differentiation because uh, they have to have a closed form of something to uh, define the gradient of that. So the, the beautiful thing uh, here is, uh, for example, this is all the uh, k-means algorithm I implemented in F-sharp. Yeah, okay, we don't have to talk about this, but I, when I was doing this, I was completely free to implement it the way I want. Like, I just implemented as a, a complicated algorithm. It, has, it is a complex procedure, it has sub-procedures, it, it can have function calls, whatever you want. Like you can write a regular algorithm. So automatic differentiation takes care of everything and it computes the derivative of the whole k-means procedure that you are writing. So as long as you're, you're effectively writing this algorithm over dual numbers instead of numbers. Yes, yeah. actually right. the way I do that, yeah, uh, you can do that, but you can have generic functions, that's, that's more useful. I, but in this, yeah, in order to get the automatic differentiation to work, the algorithm has to be working over dual numbers. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
Yes, but the, I, I'm, I, I'm also experimenting with another thing that takes a floating float function, like, and we can use uh, expression trees. Like, if you have a quotation of that, I can just go in there. I can replace all the instances of float with dual. So I can. I'm trying to make that completely transparent to the user, so they don't have to worry about the dual type. So, but that's the next step. But the easiest way to do it now is to write generic functions because you can use it the the dual run for optimization, then you can use the optimized function with other numeric types. So this is the way we do that. So AD takes the derivative of the whole k-means procedure, and it is designed as an algorithm, and it doesn't have a closed form formula. Uh, so these are just some results. Like uh, stochastic gradient descent is a very good thing here, if you have, uh, if you have large scale data, because it's it doesn't depend on the size of your data set. So it's just something to think about. And I, I also uh, forgot to tell you, so all these examples I'm showing you here, the, the code for them and the way they work and the way we implemented it, they are very well documented. If you go there, you can just try it out. Uh, you, can, you can experiment with them, you can see how they work. And so we have a Hamiltonian uh, Monte Carlo with automatic differentiation. So the thing in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, it, it's, a, it's a very good usage case for automatic differentiation because you have uh, gradients, of course. <laughs> so uh, what you do here is you have Hamiltonian mechanics described by these two functions. Uh, so it's like you, you have the uh, momentum as a function of time and you have the position of, of, of the system as a function of time. And so you have some kind of uh, discrete time integration procedure. Uh, this is called the leapfrog scheme. It's very commonly used in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So you have this time integration model, uh, which needs the gradients of uh, two functions, the, the gradient of a potential energy function and the gradient of a, a kinetic energy function. Kinetic energy is a function of momentum, and potential energy is a function of position. Uh, so this is how you implement uh, the leapfrog in using automatic differentiation. Uh, you do that, and uh, the, uh, the, the idea behind Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is uh, if you give uh, the minus logarithm of a density function as your uh, potential, potential energy, and you use a kinetic energy function, like it's typically used as the, the classical kinetic energy function is used commonly, uh, you run the Hamiltonian dynamics with these functions, and this gives you something that explores the uh, that 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 explores the uh, function, the, the density space, and it gives you samples from the uh, distribution that is uh, that is defined by the by the function you supply, the the density function. So this is uh, so normally the way you would do this in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, you are required to sit down and uh, have an expression for the gradient of the minus logarithm of your uh, target density function. This, this is needed, needed for running this procedure. But in this case, you can just uh, supply anything you want as the distribution. And uh, for example, here I have a multivariate normal, normal distribution. This is like a generic code which runs with any dimension. Like all these things you see are uh, vectors, matrices, so it's not it's not one uh, distribution case that you that is limited to, to some particular application. It's generic, and uh, I just show an example here with, uh, for the bivariate case. Like uh, it's a bivariate distribution with uh, 0 0.8 uh, correlation. So the thing here is uh, AD takes the gradient of any function you pass as a parameter. And it is applicable to uh, complex density functions. This is very important because you can have uh, density functions for which you can you can't even define uh, closed form expressions for the gradient. You can you can have algorithmic uh, descriptions of your uh, target density. So it's it's a it's a very good thing for uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, there is another thing. Uh, which is a nesting of automatic differentiation. And this is about taking derivatives of functions that also take derivatives. So uh, what we mean by that is uh, 
with using this method, you can use, uh, you can have functions that are using derivatives internally without the caller's knowledge, and you you just forget about that, and you can the differentiation is completely internal to your optimization procedure, and you can nest things many levels deep with referential transparency. So you can write things like, uh, let's say you are using a uh, gradient-based method for finding the minimum of some function. You can find that minimum. You can use that in another function that is doing something with that value. And you can again find the minimum of this other function with, again with the gradient-based minimization procedure. Uh, so the theoretical work for this is in place uh, in this article and others. And, and there are also working implementations. Uh, there is a, it is working in scheme. There is this thing called the Stalingrad compiler. And uh, we are currently working on that for Diff Sharp as well, in F Sharp. So that's, that's something else. So uh, we can talk about game theory. Uh, it's, a, it's a good application for this, I believe. Uh, so in game theory, you have this subfield called computational game theory. You can have, uh, you can have agents using gradient-based techniques for adjusting their policy. You, you can have a uh, pay expected payoff value. Uh, you can take the gradient of that uh, with respect to some policy parameter that, that represents the way you, ha you are behaving in the game. So you can write things like uh, you are adjusting the policy parameter uh, using some, uh, something that looks like gradient descent, a gradient ascent here. Uh, you, you take the derivatives of the expected payoff with respect to uh, your policy parameter. So uh, in, in this type of uh, situation, uh, so you can have an opponent, uh, you, you can have a mental model of your opponent. So you can, you can use gradient-based uh, method for deciding your behavior in the game. While you are doing that, because the, your expected payoff also depends on the behavior of your opponent. Uh, if you are doing uh, a rational method, you, you also have to consider the ways your opponent is going to behave in the game. So if you have nesting, you can also model the behavior of the opponent using a similar gradient-based procedure. And you can, you can, for example, write things like that. You can find your optimal behavior in the game by considering uh, different behaviors. And for each uh, behavior you are considering, you can consider the behavior of your agent, uh, of your opponent, uh, who is going to observe your behavior and uh, behave according to that. So you can have this nested uh, thing. So I think this is a good application for nested automatic differentiation. And a uh, very important area we can use this is hyperparameter optimization. Uh, so you can have uh, AD providing you hyper gradients of gradient descent based machine learning algorithms. So uh, a way to talk about this is uh, like is the gradient-based optimization of gradient-based optimization. So it is already considered. Uh, this is a very new paper. Uh, it's just on archive, I think, for, for a month. So they have a very good discussion of this, and they also make reference to automatic differentiation. So you can have uh, this type of hyper, hyper gradients in uh, Bayesian model selection. You can have uh, gradient based tuning of Bayesian networks. You can have gradient-based tuning of the model parameters of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So uh, if you have AD, you can have very uh, nice representations, implementations of this type of stuff. Uh, so this brings me to the summary. And so in most cases, uh, automatic differentiation is superior to symbolic and numerical met uh, alternatives. It is uh, applicable to algorithms. It's not just uh, applied to uh, functions in the mathematical sense. Uh, it makes implementations very succinct and very easy to maintain. And it, we think that it can have a big impact in machine learning. Um, so, yeah, this concludes my talk, and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, so firstly, Huna is available. Uh, um, We've got some gaps in the schedule in the rest of the day, a couple of gaps. So if anyone would like to dig into uh, any of this, they can. Uh, I'm sure he'd be uh, more than glad to like do a hands-on session with the actual Diff Sharp 
library. He's got Visual Studio and F Sharp Interactive, and you can sit down and and uh, just like play with it with uh, so with you, with, we also with have us. The paper, right? And of course, yeah, the course. yes, the have you got the latest copy of the paper? I know the, the you you will. But there's a link to it on the website. On the website, on your website, yeah. there's uh, the paper, which is the overview of. Um, yeah, of AD and machine learning. So let's take a couple of questions. Uh, to anyone? Yeah. Danny. Um, yeah, so coming from machine learning, it kind of seems to me that people are using these auto diff like tools. So could you tell me like about Theano and Stan? Yeah. Um, and so I, I understand they might not be as general, but can you help me sort of understand what the gap is and what the. Yeah, Theano is, is a way of using automatic differentiation. I think it works by. Uh, source transformation somehow. Uh, I don't exactly know how it works. Graph and so then traverses it backwards, which is essentially okay. the same so, thing. Okay, you can say people use Tiana if they use automatic differentiation. But I, as I understand, Tiana is a more general tool that is not just for AD, it does more stuff. I think I, I'm not I very familiar with Python. It's a diff tool that is sort of tuned yeah. for the use case of neural networks where they compile down to GPUs and it, oh, it, yeah, it yeah. seems to me like it, it, yeah, it is a, used quite heavily in machine learning so I'm trying to understand hmm. what's, like what, I'm trying to understand your claim that AD has this potential to shift things more. Well, I think it's, it's, a, it's some attitude like because I, I, I'm, I've, I'm compiling a list of uh, automatic differentiation libraries uh, that can be used for machine learning. I, I have uh, Python libraries, of course, but uh, the thing is, I think they don't uh, discuss these things like we do. They don't uh, point out that you can, you are not limited to mathematical expressions. Like, okay, if you are implementing something that looks like backpropagation, okay, that's not an expression, but the thing is you are you are free to to take derivatives of your algorithms. Like, I don't know. It's not something I have I have seen in literature. Not so much. Like, you, 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 if you talk about implementations from implementation perspective, people use Tian. That's that's correct. But uh, I don't know. They, I don't think they pay much attention to the differentiation part of things. I'll, I'll attempt to give a different answer, which is. You've given, it's a quantifier thing, you've given an existence proof of the use of, of, of automatic differentiation, uh, differentiation, but yeah. I think Hunas is saying, for all people, everyone <laughs> should be using automatic differentiation, which of course uh, is also at another extreme, but I think it's really a matter of degree and dissemination of the techniques into beyond the neural network case as, as well. So, but anyway, you can discuss that further about how far and where the limits are. I think that's actually, it, I mean, yes, it gets used, but the question is how much more application does it have and how widespread should the knowledge, knowledge and techniques be? I think it's a matter of degree. So, uh, ne yep. next question. So, if I understand what you're saying correctly with, with, with what Diffshark and other tools that, that's similar to are is, is trying to provide as a general purpose AD framework so I can write any algorithm in some easy way and it figures out all the derivatives uh, of which something like backpropagation for neural networks is just one instance. Yes. Um, but, I mean, I know, I mean, it seems to me that that's always going to be far less efficient at scale for, you know, to build a general tool like that. And so in practice, wouldn't this only ever really be used for prototyping? Wouldn't people then come up with a specialized domain specific solution like backprop for neural networks, which we can be computed efficiently on specialized hardware and so forth and so on? Yeah, but if you talk about backpropagation, it's domain specific, but it's exactly the same. The, the thing you get from AD is exactly the same with backpropagation. So it's I, not, you don't sure. have an but advantage. If I'm using like, something that's specifically for backprop, it's probably orders of magnitude faster than if I implemented the backprop algorithm in something like Diffsharp. So I, I believe that's not correct. So the, the thing, the way it works is it gives you exactly the same like computation. That, that is happening in backpropagation. If you do it with my library, it's going to be the, exactly the same set of operations that are running. Like, I, I have it on the website. I have the backpropagation algorithm with this. Um, we have benchmarks. So I don't know, the AD people, they really <laughs> trust the, the performance of, that, of, of, their, of their methods. So you can have, you, you have the benchmarks. I think it looks good. But you can, the, the, to a degree, the thing you say is true. You can use this for, uh, uh, per, what was it? Uh, uh, you, you can use this for testing your cases, like prototyping. 
and you can you can then you can use maybe a source transformation type of method to get the thing transformed that is, that you are going to use your in, in your final eventual application so you, so you can say it. so and i think the question would also why wouldn't that be the case in those other more established scientific domains which already use ad techniques uh, appropriately with perhaps gpu implementations and other things under the hood so i guess that would be idea for um, um, automatically driving density functions from a model, which you could then plug into an MCMC sampler. It would be quite nice to actually combine that and then do right. the Hamiltonian stuff for the... Do, 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 you do, this, do you do that in F-sharp, maybe? Uh, yeah, it was in F-sharp, actually. It was oh. using quotations, so you'd quote the model, okay, so and then you'd compute a density function and feed it to Filspa. Yeah, is, yeah. Th there is a very good chance that you can just plug your function into that. The, the code I have on that web page, you can just experiment with that, so we can we can talk about that. Okay, I haven't been tracking the time, but uh, if, if we have one more question, and then any any more questions, Simon. Are there any disadvantages? <laughs> uh, like, when would you not want to use this? Well, if you are trying to find an analytical solution to a problem, like you can just compute the analytical derivative. You can maybe say that the derivative is equal to zero. You can have an Analytical solution to a problem, then you don't need, you won't, you wouldn't need the great, uh, derivatives at all. So you can you can be after analytical solutions. It can happen sometimes. You can be after proving uh, the complexity properties of your model. So you, you need mathematical stuff for doing that. But this thing is for computing the values of derivatives for for optimization. So, so it's not. So it's not a mathematical tool. Like, <laughs> um, I, I think the operational thing. There are highly optimized, like GPU implementations of some, of, some, of many of these uh, algorithms. Uh, so for where the more general framework doesn't yet support, like the compilation down to that particular target hardware in an optimized way or something. So there are definitely operational reasons. Yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, and if anyone would like to meet with students, just grab us after the talk. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.